a good player to talk about this research and on this platform. Um, so I will talk about the field result infrared spectroscopy. Um, it's actually a new field, I would say, and as I will highlight it in a in a moment. So uh, let's uh, let's first give me a little overview uh, what I will be talking about. Uh, it will be just a little motivation why mid infrared and why spectroscopy and how we generate it and how how we detect it and what we called uh, a field result spectrometer with some uh, results and discussion. So and the region, uh, the mid infrared region is kind of a very rich region in terms of interaction. So a lot of molecules interact in this, uh, in this region and just for simplicity uh, for Probably, if some of uh, the uh, the participants are not in this uh, from this field, so in a in a very simple words, it's just kind of a language that how do you speak? So if you don't know uh, Deutsch, you can't survive in Germany, and if you don't, uh, so this is kind of the language of these molecules that. At these frequencies, if you have these frequencies, you can talk with these molecules. And once you start talking, you can came to know about them. So as you see in these uh, in these pictures, that uh, this region has many uh, many interactions with the molecules, which we found in almost uh, in everything. So this means potentially we can investigate uh, everything. Uh, which has these molecules, of course, uh, with the uh, mid infrared uh, radiations. So, like water, CO2, O3, NO2. And what we are actually interested in in our group uh, under Professor Ferenc Krauss is to study the biomolecules. And if uh, you look at the biomolecules, you have, like in human blood, you have lipids, you have proteins, you have nucleic acid, carbohydrates, and all of these have uh, their um, eigenfrequencies in this mid infrared region. So if uh, if we have a look on how we can get the mid infrared, so traditionally we have kind of some thermal sources that are very broadband, but they are not very bright uh, they don't have uh, spatial and temporal coherence uh, and the size is kind of okay they don't have so much big size and if we go slightly advanced uh, mid infrared sources then we have the synchrotrons uh, which of course have uh, which can provide a very broad bandwidth they can be very bright they have spatial coherence but they have very poor uh, temporal coherence and also uh, uh, the people who are familiar they know that the size is probably more than a uh, football ground and they are very expensive and kind of loose uh, user scale facilities that you need um, to wait a lot to get access to such a facility uh, just because of um, a lot of users and only one single facility with a high cost and then we come towards uh, the laser based sources and unfortunately there are not so many materials that can provide uh, the lasing directly in these uh, interesting uh, regions of mid infrared radiations but if you can somehow manage to get uh, a source uh, from a laser uh, it can provide uh, a very reasonable bandwidth it is uh, very bright if you have enough power to drive the process it has the spatial uh, and temporal coherence uh, in fact uh, probably state of the art temporal coherence and they are very small in size so this is just a table an optical table uh, scale facility so here i will talk about the laser based uh, mid infrared uh, generation and then uh, the detection uh, process how we detect uh, 
the electric field and just a glimpse of uh, application um, yeah so as i mentioned earlier like the motivation for us is to do the vibrational spectroscopy of biofluids uh, this is a cartoon picture which shows that if you have a few cycle infrared light and then you put just a tiny amount of uh, biofluid let's say blood which has all of these um, uh, proteins and carbohydrates and so on then this laser just kick uh, the vibrational modes of these molecules and then these molecule gives a specific signal uh, to uh, in the wake of your laser field so this is our goal and kind of a grand goal is to push these limits towards the early uh, stage uh, detection of uh, uh, of uh, diseases such as cancer so uh, this is kind of our, our group which is focused on biomedical applications and my group is specific towards the laser development so what we in the laser group want to do is uh, is to build up a, a source which can provide a broadband and very stable electric field of light and this electric field should be detected in, in, a, in a very with a high dynamic range which is kind of unparalleled which is demonstrated anywhere in the world as uh, not in anywhere but at least with these specifications as I will show uh, at the end of my of my presentation so we just want to improve the detection sensitivity and specificity so as I uh, just mentioned that you need a broadband source then you have molecules and then you will just hear what these molecules says so what you can do you can uh, listen to them kind of uh, in uh, via recording the intensity or the electric field so what is done in a, in in, a, in the community in a worldwide community that you put a photodiode there and you record the intensity and whichever uh, molecules you have in the middle they just absorb some light which shows uh, as a dip in your um, which which appears as a dip in in your um, in your intensity so you measure like a wavelength resort intensity and then you know which molecules these are and then you can study it and so on but what our groups do and which is um, kind of very innovative uh, is that we measure the electric field of light and if you measure the electric field of light after this pulse the pulse laser pulse has excited these molecules then the molecule resonate and if you record the electric field long enough you will see the beating of these molecules and from these beatings of these molecules you have the information about about your sample and then you can study it further for a given application but what is important here is if you measure intensity the intensity needs to be very stable uh, if you have noise in the intensity then the small uh, absorption will be just buried in those uh, in those noise but if you are measuring the electric field what we do uh, then this electric field needs to be very reproducible and that the phase of this electric field needs to be very stable uh, because if the field jitters then this will mess up to a certain extent your your measurement and disturb your signal to noise ratio and uh, the electric field uh, so you need uh, a stability of the carrier envelope phase of the electric field uh, typically in the community these uh, uh, cb stability is done in an active way or in a passive way in an active way you need electronics and you need uh, some additional stuff uh, to stabilize it but we prefer to do it passively because it's more uh, 
uh, intuitive and intrinsic uh, and simple way so what a passive schemes do uh, you just have two beams you mix them up in a nonlinear crystal um, and then this nonlinear crystal will give you a third radiation in our case we we mix uh, two beams and then it gives us the idle beam which is in the mid infrared region uh, given the design consideration of the experiment so what you need in this nonlinear crystal that it needs to be a very high quality crystal it needs to be transparent in all of these radiations that you have in the input and output it needs to have a high nonlinear coefficient um, and uh, broadband mixing bandwidth in a in a kind of simple picture you have these two pulses if they are coming from a same uh, same front then you mix them up in a crystal that their um, their uh, Uh, frequencies get subtracted uh, so if you see um, this uh, phase term here if they are coming from the same source they will share the same phase and this same phase will get subtracted and you get a very stable phase in the output uh, th so the same scheme can be done in in in, 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 in even a more simple way that if you have a very broad band input uh, beam here not the two beams but just one beam which is very broadband and then you mix them in an in a nonlinear crystal such that this outer wing this part is interact with this part then this phase get cancelled and you get a very broadband uh, output of the mid infrared radiations so i will i will just give you a quick uh, results on both of these schemes that are demonstrated in our group the first scheme is typically a called uh, optical parametric sorry last two minutes oops i thought i have 7 uh, or 8 minutes okay then i will go rather uh, uh, skip this part so uh, in in a non linear crystal this is just a list of the crystals and then um, Uh, their uh, their parameters that how do you design you have the pump beam you have some fibers which create a broadband other signal and then you mix in a non linear crystal um and these results are demonstrated like 2 years ago uh, that for for a input of 50 watts we can get um, a few watts uh, in mid infrared uh, in this uh, down conversion process and then you can tune uh the wavelength of your generation you can do at lower wavelength you can do at higher wavelengths and now i will go uh, towards the field resolved uh, spectrometer I, and i will just skip this one part and this uh, diagnostic parts this is how the system or the full spectrometer look like you have a laser oscillator which provides uh, uh, millions of pulses in a second um, it's high power and then you just broaden it so that it's broad and enough you can mix the outer parts you uh, do the dfg in a non linear crystal the mid infrared radiations the red beam goes towards the sample and the other beam which is used to detect this mid infrared beam goes in a separate path you do the spatial and temporal overlap and then you detect the electric field in electro optic sampling and how do the electro optic sampling work or how does it measure the electric field uh, so you just delay the gate pulse with respect to your mid infrared pulse the red beam and depending upon the strength of the red beam the the polarization of this beam cut modified and if you delay at different points you just measure this uh, change in the polarization state and then you just by this way by subtracting these two signals you get the electric field of light so let me give you a quick uh, update and how good uh, our dynamic range or the signal to noise ratio is that this is the black curve of our spectrum that we can measure and if we attenuate our beam by 10000 time we can still measure it which is this 4 od with 16 seconds of measurement time so we can uh, even attenuate it 
bit more by 100 times so as you can see we can attenuate 10 to the power 12 times and we can still see some signal so this is the sensitivity that we can achieve with this uh, with this instrument and these results were published earlier this year in in nature by our group um, and other uh, application um, so I will skip this part as well just because of time uh, I can comment if someone wants to uh, in, in questions uh, that how how well we can detect with the state of the art in the market so as I mentioned earlier uh, the state of the art is uh, in these regions is the FTIR which has um, more than 50 years of development uh, for this purpose just to compare our instrument with the FTIR um, uh, we prepared a concentration of uh, DMSO molecule in water and then we know that what we prepared what concentration our sample has and then we measure this concentration with both of these instruments with our instrument and with FTIR to see how small concentration levels these devices can measure and as you can see the laser based instrument uh, can measure more than which is shown in red bars here it can measure more than a factor of 30 lower concentration as compared to the state of the art FTIR um, just concluding uh, what uh, what I have shown is that uh, a very high power infrared laser source which has unprecedented wavelength stability the slide I skipped is sh it shows that we have on the level of auto seconds stability in our measurement so few tens or hundreds of auto seconds and auto seconds is 10 to the power minus 18 seconds and it overcomes many limitations of other techniques such as coherence brightness and dynamic range so all together this opens up uh, a new avenue of uh, application in vibrational uh, spectroscopy and the graph shown here uh, just show how bright this source is in this spectral region as compared to the synchrotron so it's kind of thousand to ten thousand times more bright uh, in this region so yeah just I will thank uh, my my colleagues because the it was a big team effort uh, under the supervision of uh, Professor Ferenc Krauss. So I'm open to the questions if there are any. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ali Hussain. <coughs> now the talk is open for questions. We have a couple of questions. Uh, uh, let's start with uh, Arslan Sajid uh, Raja. Okay, so a very nice talk, Ali. Uh, you can hear me, huh? Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, I want to ask you, like, okay, first on the spectroscopy side, how your technique compare with the dual comb spectroscopy plus the photoacoustic spectroscopy, and on the source side, do you see some kind of advantage of using QCL instead of this OPO down conversion and a different frequency generation? Because the the setup look complex. So if you want to commercialize this technology, so I feel like QCL will be a much better source there. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, very good and uh, relevant question. So in this publication, we have compared. Uh, this uh, publication I mentioned uh, which was published in nature earlier this year we have compared that how does this compare with other frequency based uh, technologies like dual comp and so on and it, it overcomes uh, it's, it's better in, in, in the very simple way in all of the other techniques and coming towards the QCL um, yeah, the QC, the problem with QCL is it's it's not very broadband and it's not that stable. The level of stability I, I am showing here, for example, this level of stability in this electric field is is just less than ten autoseconds. So uh, it it it's um, uh, maybe I I will it's safe to say that it's kind of a record uh, sensitivity with the measurement of the electric field. So none of the other techniques can approach near to it. Thanks. Yeah, I can expect this from Frank Kraus Group. Yeah. yeah thanks. thanks. <laughs> so uh, the next question is from uh, uh, Dr. Zahid Farooq, sir. Yes, please. 
switch on your uh, microphone. Uh, Dr. Zahid Farooq. Can you listen to me, Ali? Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, uh, this is a very wonderful talk and uh, I appreciate your work. You have done very recent and uh, uh, it, it might be not a question, but it's a type of suggestion that uh, you have done a very good work. Uh, what you are looking at, what type of uh, prospective or consequences uh, in near future in Pakistan? Uh, would you have high-tech labs uh, in which you can do work, this type of work? Uh, for the, you know, definitely for the benefit of uh, uh, all over the world, for humanity, but specifically for the people of Pakistan. For how you how you are looking for in future that uh, you will get what type of opportunity and what type of scope in this field? Yeah, thanks. This is a very, very good question, I would say. And I was, uh, look, I was kind of thinking on these questions a lot in the past. Uh, so the, the, the benefit is kind of many folds in many directions. Um, so first of all, if you are doing such a state of the art, uh, working with such a techniques and so on. So you are not developing only this technique, but you are getting a feeling of whole field, uh, like the, how, how does the advanced laser systems work and all of the related applications to this. So if, if I would be doing a similar work in Pakistan, it will probably won't be exactly the same, but the, the knowledge and skills that I got from uh, such such a work because it's uh, effort of many years that you get you kind of beating all of the other techniques in, in this uh, specific application or in specific domain so you have worked a lot and that uh, your training helps you uh, in in new uh, in new fields uh, for example whatever uh, I or any other colleague will be doing in this regard. For example, I have to do simulations for this process, which I didn't touch in this presentation. So this you can do. You can do the collaborations with other colleagues. If you are doing, uh, if I will be in Pakistan doing such a stuff on a simulation basis, I can co collaborate with the experimental groups here um, and so on. So it it's, uh, it has many directions. Okay. Nice, nice. All for the best. And yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, I think that in Pakistan there is also optics lab, and uh, <clears throat> in common uh, commission there are also some, uh, I guess, availabilities. Maybe there would be some uh, connection. Of course, the international collaborations are always uh, the best way to go ahead. So the last question uh, of our today's conference is from uh, Naim Ahmed. Yes, please switch on your. Uh, microphone yes hello can you hear me yeah uh, so uh, Ali very nice talk so I just want to ask like how is the day-to-day -day reprodu reproducibility and like the stability of your source actually so because uh, you will be measuring like different kind of samples in the end so uh, you haven't talked about this I guess so if you can just briefly describe this yeah, this is also another uh, very good question because what we want to do in this system is not demonstrate that we are very good in a certain region of applications, but we really uh, focused on real life applications. And uh, so that's why uh, the results that are demonstrated here are not like the best performance of the instrument, but they are demonstrated for a long term stability a performance like on really day-to-day -day basis so just to give you a flavor how good the system is in terms of reprodu reproducibility is um, I think more than a year ago we have measured more than three days consecutively with this high power laser system so 24 hours continuously three continuous days of measurement um, so this uh, I think probably answers uh, the questions that how how stable this uh, this uh, system and source is um, and also I didn't uh, shown um, one of these slides that we have diagnostics in every step 
of the instruments to ensure the day-to-day -day reproduci reproducibility. So we have more than 15 diagnostics just on the front end to check how good uh, the performance is or how comparable the performance is as compared to the yesterday or the day before or in the past and so on. Yeah. Thank you so much. Good. Thank you very much, <coughs> Naim Ahmed. You was uh, lucky that you asked the last question of this uh, uh, first day of the conference. Thanks. So uh, here, actually, thank you very much, Ali. <coughs> and I also thank all the speakers for the morning and the afternoon session, and also the attendees that you actually make uh, this day. Uh, we are looking forward to see you all tomorrow. Thank you very much for attending the conference and thank you very much speakers for giving wonderful talks uh, today. So here we conclude our first day. Thank you very much.